And so sort of don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be all that profound because um, if statements and for loops and classes and servers and things like that, they're all very important. Uh, it's just there is a whole lot else going on besides. Um, so as Alv Alvaro mentioned, I'm, my name is Robert Heaton. Uh, I work at Stripe uh, and I currently work on application security where I'm building a system that will automatically find uh, bugs and security flaws in our various Ruby programs. Um, obviously, I'm sure we don't have any bugs or security flaws anywhere, but I felt I should just double check. And before that, I worked on stopping credit card fraud uh, and on various types of machine learning as well. And when I was preparing for this talk um, briefly, I, th I was thinking about the different things that I most admire uh, about the people that I work with and also the characteristics and some of the habits that I strive and try the hardest to inculcate in myself. Um, and so if, if some of the points do start to sound a bit too much like unrequested life coaching or something, then I, I do apologize in advance. And um, so before we start, I should say the list is, of course, it's not exhaustive and impo more importantly, sort of none of the suggestions on it are sort of anything close to hard rules or requirements. And you might even disagree with some of them. And if you do, I would love to know why. Uh, and in any case, you should only ever do what you're comfortable with. And if a suggestion is not comfortable or practical for you, then that's not going to be a problem. Uh, and you're just still going to be amazing. Don't worry. So I've divided these traits into three categories, which are working in a team, managing projects, and writing code. Yep, got it. And so number one uh, for working in a team is don't malign bad code. Because it is a fact that a lot of the code you work with is not going to be uh, like pristine or perfectly arranged masterpieces or anything like that. But it was still it was still written by real people operating under real constraints. And this happens a lot. I've written some like very bad code in the past when I just had to get something done quickly and it needed to get out there. And I think many, most other people would have done the same thing in the same situations that um, that given these constraints, it's not a surprise uh, how the code ends up working. And it's a fact that most of the code, or not most of it, but some of the code that you write is not going to be pristine either. Uh, but that's also OK, because the cor corollary to don't malign bad code, hi, from, uh, hi Nigeria, is um, don't malign yourself. Uh, and by this, I mean, don't malign, sort of don't publicly beat yourself up uh, if you're, for your mistakes, if you can at all avoid it. So if you write some sketchy code, you don't have to let everyone else on your team know, look, I know this is really bad, but oh, I just it's terrible. Don't but don't worry about it. And if you write a bug and it gets deployed and something bad happens, you don't have to say, oh, it's my fault. I'm an idiot. I should never have done that. Because uh, when that happens, it's it makes it can make other people feel like they need to do the same thing that uh, that, that whenever anyone makes a mistake, they need to, to sort of to really. Um, excoriate themselves for it and you don't want to contribute to something like that because in general you want your mistakes to be blameless in any team and that includes blaming yourself the third one is be reliable which is probably the quality that i care about and that i try to focus on most in myself uh, i find it extremely powerful and um, when the people that you work with can just know with sort of cast iron certainty that when you say you're going to do something it's going to get done just efficiently and quickly and without mistakes and this obviously, this might sound obvious, but I've personally found that this sort of cast iron bulletproof reliability is not something that actually happens by default and it does require work. Fourth is be approachable. Uh, and by this, I mean making yourself available for answering questions about stuff that other people might not know that you might know. Uh, and possibly the most important aspect of this is stay approachable as you get more experienced. In fact, try to get even more approachable. Uh, there are many, many extremely impressive people at Stripe who I still feel sort of quite in awe of. Uh, and I find it really hard sometimes to ask them for help um, with stuff that I'm working on, even if they uh, are extremely well suited to it. Because if someone say if someone's an expert in Ruby, like a real, real uh, working on the Ruby interpreter expert, why would they want to help me um, with their, my like small little silly question? But many of these people, they do put a lot of work and effort into convincing people that, no, no, I am, I'm very experienced. I've done this a lot, but I would still love to help you um, with whatever it is you're working on. Uh, and this is really appreciated by me uh, and many others. Next, we've got work with good people, which is something that a lot of people say. And then the, the sort of question that I ask is what happens to the bad people? Um, I don't know. 
uh, I'm sure they go somewhere. Uh, but this advice is right. Um, and I've always found that working with, uh, with, with people who are motivated and friendly and who are more experienced than you is an extremely effective way um, to supercharge the, your learning and development. And one way that can happen is by when you give good code review. Uh, what then tends to happen to some code, most, and indeed ideally all code that's written in Teams, is that you write it, you have your change to, the, to your code base, and then you put it up for someone else to look at. And then they'll give offer suggestions, try and find some bugs in it if they can. And then only once they've confirmed that it looks good, will you actually merge it and then deploy it. But when you're asked to review someone's code, it can be extremely tempting. It's, it's so tempting to just glance at it and be like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. It's probably, probably all right. But you'll learn a lot more uh, and, and your reviewee and we'll learn a lot more if you sort of take the time to actually understand what it's trying to do, how it fits in with the rest of the system, and also think about how you would, ta you would tackle the same problem. And also, more importantly, your team will have fewer bugs. Uh, a, a former coworker of mine uh, was very fond of citing this study. I haven't actually read the study. I assume it exists and he wasn't lying, where he claimed that even bulletproof airline quality, like powering the airline system in the country, even that quality of code has a bug every sort of 500, uh, 500 lines or so. So if you say, sure, it looks fine, it's probably good, there's a very strong chance that you're wrong. On the other hand, giving good code review is, is hard and it takes a really long time. So point eight is making your own code easy to review. Uh, if you're going to ask someone to check out what you've written, sort of make it possible for them to actually understand it. So this obviously means make it well structured, make it clear and so on, all of that good stuff. But it also means not making very many changes at one time. If you have, if you change like a hundred lines of code and you say, here's exactly what I've done, here's why, and here's the very uh, specific um, change that I expected to happen, that's, that's not so hard. But if you ask them to review a 1000 line behemoth that might sort of fundamentally restructure four different things at the same time, uh, that's a whole lot harder. Uh, and that's what often results in people just being like, I can't understand this, I'm sure it's fine. And that's what causes bad deploys and bugs and things like that. The next thing I want to talk about is managing projects. And if you remember just one thing about this talk, then please make it point, point number 10, which is break projects up into chunks. So for example, suppose you're asked to, to make a web app that plays chess, and that's quite a lot of work. And there's loads of different aspects to it, loads of different sides. So where do you start? You might just sort of just start doing it, do a bit of the board, a bit of the display, a bit of just try and do everything at once. But then your whole life, I promise, your whole life will get much easier if you just think about and write down the different steps, the different chunks that you're going to need to to do. So, for example, first, all you need to do is make an empty board. You've got to have an empty board to start with. And then you'll somehow need to put some pieces on it. That's it. And then you'll need some way to move them around and so on and so on. And a big part of this is that each step, you're deciding what you are not going to worry about. So for example, in our chess game, when we're talking about letting players move things, I would start by just letting them move a piece from anywhere to anywhere. I wouldn't worry about checking whether it was a valid move. They could move a rook diagonally or a knight along a file, anything like that. And then it's only once we've got that working, then maybe we can start to think about, okay, how do we think stop illegal moves and things like that, that we're just rigorously, rigorously focusing on um, just one thing at a time. Next up is just to finish things. Uh, the last 10% of the project usually takes about 90% of the work. And it's also very rarely the, the glamorous, exciting stuff. It's stuff like fixing silly bugs or updating documentation or explaining the system to other people or making dashboards or anything like that. And it's not, it's not the most fun part of the project, but it can be, that makes it extremely tempting to just move on to the next thing and sort of try and finish that on the side. But on the millions of occasions where I've done this, I always end up just having to juggle both of them. And I feel responsible for getting them both done immediately. Um, and it's just too much work and too much pressure to handle at one time. So wherever possible, I always try to finish finish a project properly before moving on to the next one. And so point 12 is extremely related to this, is minimizing work in progress. And the analogy I like here is of a car factory. So say you have a, a car factory that has 200 half-finished cars in there. 
And these cars are very visible capital that they're just sitting there achieving nothing, that they're, they're wasted money for the company until they get finished and until uh, they can actually be sold. And so what's the software equivalent of that? It's undeployed work in progress code. 200 half finished projects, they're much less visible and much less painful to deal with than 200 half finished cars, but they're just as useless until they're finished and deployed. And um, so even if it feels sort of may, may like it might not be the most efficient thing, just putting in the effort to try and get things deployed and getting them over the line is really, really worth it. 13 is do uncertain things first. So as I mentioned, I'm currently working on this system to find bugs and security flaws automatically uh, in Ruby code. And there, systems like this do already exist for low level languages like C, but for various reasons, uh, people just haven't tried to apply these techniques to Ruby yet. And to be honest, I'm extremely unsure that this fundamental idea will work at all. Uh, it might just not be possible to, to automatically find bugs or security flaws in Ruby. Um, so since there's uh, there's just a lot of, infra even though there's a lot of infrastructure work that needs uh, doing as well, uh, I'm focusing on this this uncertain piece, this whether it is possible to fuzz things to, to find bugs in Ruby code at all. And only once I've started, uh, sort of finished, finished that, will I do the things where I'm more certain that they will be possible. And as part of this project, I'm using a whole lot of point 14, which is to write tools. Uh, I've written various harnesses and scripts that will evaluate how fast my code is, exactly which lines of code are getting it, uh, executed, and how some of the weird internals, because there's some weird stuff going on in there, uh, are actually working. And having these scripts means that it's much easier for me to just keep running these and see how they change as my system changes. And even more importantly, it makes it much easier for other people uh, to run when they need to understand the system. And so this kind of encapsulates point 15, which is just write good tools. Uh, even if you're writing just a little diagnostic tool that only a few people you work with are ever going to see, I think it's really worth the effort to make it just clear what it's doing, pleasant to interact with, uh, and just an all round good user experience, even if there aren't gonna be very many users. So this is the point at which we get to start talking about writing code. Um, well, almost, since point 16 is just closed Slack. Um, whilst you're programming. And I'm sure everyone's developed their own systems for being focused and productive, but please at least fold this one thing in. Uh, my life got much better and I got much happier when I started doing this. And in fact, also please do this next point, which is to use a timer. And you can call it Pomodoro or whatever whimsical name that means a fruit that you like. But I find that I'm so much happier and so much more effective um, when I have this little timer that goes off every 45 minutes and just tells me to go off and make some tea. Next, we've got just don't worry. Uh, and it does feel to me at times that imposter syndrome is becoming a bit of a buzzword, but I do think that's probably just because it's such a familiar condition um, to so many different people. Uh, and I suspect that so many, that everyone has their own long list of things that they have to know about and learn about before they can consider some, themselves a real programmer or before other people won't think that they're a terrible fraud. I know I have my list of those things. And my favorite example of this is actually my wife who recently started her first software engineering job a few months ago. And when she was learning programming, she started with Python, which is great. It's an extremely sensible place to start. But then she thought, okay, well, I can't learn about Python until I know about HTTP, which is fine. I mean, understand HTTP, why not? And then she decided, well, I can't learn about HTTP until I know about networking. Yeah, she's done well. And then uh, she also needed to know about browsers. And then I turned my back for um for just a few seconds and she then she'd ordered this book about electromagnetic waves and how they travel through the internet backbone because she really felt that no one was going to respect her python skills until she knew about uh, electromagnetic waves and so uh, i think my the what the thing that i've concluded there is that sort of by all means read about all these things and anything and everything that interests you but i promise you that you almost certainly don't need to know any greater than like 10% of the list of things that you need to know before you can be a very just solid and useful and solid software developer. And if you're participating in some program like Microverse, then you're almost certainly uh, on the right track. And in any case, 19 is just never do anything clever unless you really have to, unless you have any alternative, no alternative. Yep. So don't use a class, say, if all you really know it need is a function. And don't write some sort of fancy library if you just need a little if statement. 
and don't write sort of cryptic, fancy, difficult code when you could do the same thing just using little techniques that everybody knows. Just keep it simple wherever possible. And whether you're writing something simple or complex, try and think in terms of interfaces. And by interface, I mean, is this is a word that gets used quite often. Uh, and I mean the contract that your code has um, with the person who's using it. So for example, with our chess example, it could be, you could have a function that says, if you give me a chess board, I will tell you if someone has won, if it's checkmate. And then if you can split your code up into lots of these discrete sort of boards with these words, sorry, blocks with these well-defined little interfaces, then you can change how the internals of these blocks work without having the other blocks having to actually care. And so, because when I give you this chessboard, I ask you, has anyone won? I don't care how you figure it out. All I want to know is the answer. So you're free to adjust that logic and tweak it whilst being completely confident that it's not gonna um, interfere with the rest of the code. But no matter how nice your interfaces are, things are going to go wrong. And point 21 is to be paranoid about that. And by this, I don't just mean test your code, make sure it works. It will, that will obviously do that. But you'll have plenty of times where your code works perfectly, but then just something weird will happen. So maybe you get some input, some bizarre input you weren't expecting, or one of your servers explodes and just dies, or you get, um, you maybe uh, some other system changes the way that it works, for example. And in each case, just do think about the possibilities uh, and try and help your code deal with this gracefully. So for example, don't make sure you don't corrupt the database. That's obvious, but don't do it. Um, try to have backup servers or maybe make it easy to, to roll back changes to undo them. Uh, and if you can deploy them gradually, that's great. If you have 20 servers all running the same code, why not just try testing it on one first? My second to last point, is to make your decisions easy to reverse. And software development always is always about trade-offs. The different approaches have different strengths and they also have different weaknesses. And it's rare that there's gonna be one approach that is just completely always definitely better. And so uh, when you're making these decisions, of course you should sort of think about them um, and just weigh up the, the different options and then make the best decision you have based on the information you have at the time. But if at all possible, sometimes it's not, but leave yourself some wiggle room to change your mind. So coming back to my auto bug finder project that I've been talking about, um, there are lots of different fuzzing engines. So things that sort of do all, run all of the different tests on your code. And they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, we've settled on using one called AFL, but it could be that there's another one called libfuzzer that might be better, or there's another one called hongfuzz that might be even better. Honestly, we don't know which one's going to be best. Um, so what we've done is structure the project in such a way that it's not that hard. It would require a bit of work, but it's not that hard to rip out AFL and replace it with something like libfuzzer. So these decisions, whilst we want to get them right where possible, we can structure our code in such a way that they're not actually that high stakes. And if we somehow get it wrong or anything like that, then it's not so much of a big deal. Uh, I will finish with one final piece of advice, and that's that the quickest way to write code is to not write it at all. And though even though I've been counseling you to be to reliable, focused, confident, just generally awesome, I would also encourage you to just be lazy and try to put off work if you can, and to always lean towards doing just the simplest, easiest thing, uh, and just making life easy to your, for yourself. Uh, and that way, just avoiding work is the absolute quickest way to do it at all. Uh, that's all I've got for um, what I wanted to talk about, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or talk about anything else as well. Thank you very much, Robert, for sharing your your tw 23 points to the success. There are many, there are many interesting um, things there. Give me a sec to get the webcam on. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Sorry. Perfect. Um, well, while, while you were mentioning the Donma line yourself, um, in your experience, do you have a way of telling that a code is good enough or, or do you have any sort of rule of thumb to say like, this is, this is, ready, to, this is ready to be deployed or how, how do you know when to stop? That's a good question. 
Let's see. I think it certainly depends on the situation that if you're dealing with some sort of critical production um, interface. So like, for example, for Stripe, the API, the, the Stripe um, product that actually accepts payments, you should really be very certain about the code that you deploy to that. You, you don't really want to be very experimental unless you really, really know what you're doing. Um, whereas on the other hand, if it's, uh, say, an internal tool that maybe even only you, you use, um, then maybe you can be a bit more, a bit more sort of fast and loose. Um, another thing is how many tests do you have? If you have a lot of tests and they all pass, then that's that gives you a lot more confidence uh, than tests that than code that just doesn't have very many tests, where you're kind of just hoping that some of it works. And also, just code review is is a good way to at least get some extra thoughts on this. That if someone else that if you can explain, here's why I, here's what I did. I know that it's sort of not ideal from this point of view, but it's, I think that's worth it because of this. Um, then I think that helps if someone else will agree, agrees with that. That's very insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you're, you're an advocate of TDD? Uh, not, I'm, I don't do strict TDD. Um, I, so by by TDD, I understand you write your tests first, and then you just regular you that then you you are always sort of staring at and focusing on your tests. Um, where, whereas I'm more happy to just maybe start writing some of the code, then maybe add a few tests, then go and write some more code, and then add a few tests. Uh, but I'm a strong advocate of tests, definitely. It, it's just it makes it makes your project and code so much more relaxing to work on if you if you know that you haven't broken anything <laughs> yes definitely thank you thank you for that robert um we've got a question from paul who asks how much are employers willing to allocate towards uncertain ideas that are not guaranteed will be able mm. to work yeah uh i think this has to be extremely company and even team dependent um there are some Certainly at Stripe, I can think of various products that we've tried uh, that where it was known that they might not work or they, they might just be a failure. Uh, I mean, a recent one is uh, Stripe now has a magazine called Increment. The, that's a pretty weird thing to do for a software company is to release a magazine. And that could easily have just been a, a total flop. But it turns out it's done just amazingly and really well. Uh, but there are plenty of other products that we've, we've shut down. Uh, maybe not plenty, but we don't do Bitcoin anymore, for example, and that's fine. Not a, not a big deal. Um, then with with teams, I think that's another level of sort of difficulty that that if you're a team that's say responsible for infrastructure uh, and for the whole company, and you've got loads and loads of people asking you for more and more features for all of your different bits of infrastructure, it's going to be really hard to to carve out time to do that. And um, there are some, we've got a few more experimental teams where the whole remit is experimental. So maybe that's one way that it comes up where if you can get enough people and especially people um, high, senior enough in the organization to buy into your ideas and turn it into an official team, then you're kind of been agreed that you have the leeway to do it. So overall, I think it's very dependent, but I'm almost certain that companies don't allocate enough. Um, that I don't think anyone's good at thinking about risk and reward because the calculations involved are so much more difficult than small, simple questions. Sorry, there's someone ringing a bell outside. Uh, and you're, you're gonna hear. I, can, I can go down the list. I can keep going. Yes, please. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so the, the next question on the list is what kind of projects should a junior developer work on to improve their portfolio? Um, again, this is very, it's very dependent. Um, I, I don't, I think the best thing is just do things that you like, to be honest, that if you like and enjoy um, working on something, then you're more likely to continue doing it. You're more likely to enjoy it and it will sort of start to spread out into 
to new different things. If there's nothing that you enjoy, then well, okay, maybe you need to force yourself. Well, you probably need to think about why am I even doing this? <laughs> but, uh, but if there are things that you enjoy, I would just start with them, to be honest. Um, if you if you find that that's not working for you for whatever reason, then okay, maybe you can consider and then maybe just projects related to the type of work you want to do. So if you want to do data science, there are plenty of um, plenty of public data sets you can start trying to analyze. Uh, if you want to try machine learning, then there's a lot of that, that's a bit harder, but there's a lot of open source tools. And if you want to write web apps, then just think of a problem that you have that you want to solve for yourself and then just do that. And then you can publish it and put it online and go from there. So I would I would really be just guided on what by what you think is fun. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, just a little side talk. Um, which are the challenges of writing uh, an automatic bug detector for Ruby? And why is, why does this already exist in C? And, and what's again, what's the challenge of building this in for Ruby? Yeah. The, there are several or maybe many challenges. So the reason it exists for C is that the types of bugs that these, they're called fuzzers. So a tool that finds, that automatically um, throws in loads and loads of different types of inputs to a program is called a fuzzer. That's what it's all about. And the types of bugs they're most good at finding are called um, memory overflow bugs, which you don't really get in these high level languages like Ruby or Python or anything like that. You're much more likely to see them or you will only see them in these low level languages like C. And that's the kind of bug where maybe you expected an input to only be 16 bits uh, long, but then someone passes in 17 bytes and that means they get to write to a piece of memory you didn't expect them to. And that's not that that's the kind of bug that these fuzzers are quite good at finding because they are the kinds of inputs that a human probably wouldn't think to input uh, to enter. Um, so, for example, there's there's a, a, a low level C library called libjpg that is used for making JPEGs. And if you put in in previous versions, if you put in various weird uh, types of inputs, it would just crash and um, and explode. And the way that this is done, so there's there's then more ways of working on fuzzers that you can either just randomly throw in garbage input until you find a crash. Uh, that's not a very efficient way of doing it because you have no you're just trying random things you're not informing your choices in any way but what tools like afl which stands for american fuzzy lock which is a type of rabbit what tools like that do is instrument the program that you're trying to run you're trying to find bugs in and what instrument means is when you run the program afl is able to see what code paths were taken so it can see okay when i put in this input went all like this around the code and then when I put in this other input I just twiddled one of the bytes it made it explore this new code path so it can think oh that byte is quite interesting I should see what happens when I twiddle that and this helps guide it to decide what it's going to do in the future so that's fine for C um, but for various reasons because Ruby is not compiled it can't you can't instrument it in at least you, the same way uh, so instead what we've had to do is add some Ruby layers that will twiddle bytes and tell AFL what code paths have been taken um, and allow AFL to do this same um, smart um, smart thinking where it sees, okay, if I twiddle this, then it finds an interesting path. If I twiddle this, well, actually, that's a bit boring, so I'm not going to try and do that. And so the main, the two main challenges are just adapting the C tool to Ruby that maybe that's just not a good idea for some reason, who knows? Uh, and also uh, Ruby is much slower, like much, 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 much slower than C. And the name of the game when you're fuzzing is just going as fast as possible and doing as many iterations as possible because most of your inputs are just gonna be garbage and completely pointless. So you need to be able to go, I mean, ideally just hundreds, thousands of requests um, executions per second. Um, with Ruby, I mean, we, we're up to like 20, uh, which if you've got enough machines and enough cores is okay. You can just spread it, spread the work along, but it makes it a much less, um, it's, it's a challenge to overcome. So if it works, it's going to be amazing. Um, if it doesn't, then, well, I, I said it might not work, so don't blame me. There, there are there, lessons there are... in between. I, I... Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. it, 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 it has been very, very eye-opening and 
going through the whole journey that you have shared, it, it's really, really interesting. Cool. Oh, we have another question from Paul. Um, various individuals have talked about uh, decreasing hiring, in hiring rates in the last couple of years, particularly for junior developer roles, along with a couple theories as to why that might be case in the last couple of years. Has the Stripe changed its hiring practices, hiring rates in the last in, in the last little while? Have you observed a drop change in hiring? Mm -hmm. It's definitely it's definitely something that comes up. Um, I couldn't. I'm not up to date on the latest things that we've been doing, but it is it is a known concern and um, something that that we want to be aware of. And I think the thing that we're most cautious about is the absolute worst thing. I think is hiring junior people without being able to mentor them because I think it's it not that anyone is claiming this, but it would it's just not true that junior people can just start and then just go straight away that um they they're going to need some help spinning up and getting up to speed and that's completely fine but it does mean that there will need to be people whose time uh, can be spent on that and also who have the resources and tools they need to do that so i think the main thing we want to do again i, I can't speak exactly for stripe because uh, i'm not up to, up to speed but the main thing we want to do is make sure we don't do that and then slowly try to um to expand the range of people that we are able to hire but yes i i do agree that that is that is a real phenomenon that um, paul mentions i'm gonna try i'm gonna try to connect um uh, these questions with with the uh, with paul's question and from your list of traits which if you had to pick three which ones would you pick or, or if somebody wanted to start and, mm. and use your list of traits like as a guide which which would be like the top three traits that one can focus on mastering for for making making it easier to get a job or things like that uh the thing i don't know if it would necessarily I think the things to do, so the two things in the coding section that I think are most important are thinking in terms of interfaces. So this idea of having these contracts that are fixed and these different building blocks um, that build up your code. Another word that you might hear used here is modular. That, that has really helped me think about how to structure code. And I think it's very related to, um, to point number 10 which is breaking projects into chunks so rather than trying to just do the whole thing at once find sort of break it out into these small discrete problems that you can work on individually and i think that makes that makes projects big projects a whole lot easier to work with and when one thing i've noticed when working with my wife is that when i first tried uh, to sort of talk about this idea these ideas with her uh, she thought that i was kind of fobbing her off where i was saying okay, well, we'll just do this rubbish version and it won't do this, it won't do that, but it's what we should do. And she couldn't help but think that I was saying, oh, well, you're not good enough to do the, the full bit thing yet, so we'll just do this tough down simple version. But then eventually I was like, no, I, I promise you, it's this is how I would do it. I'm not trying to get you to do something um, <laughs> rubbish. This is just what I think is the right way to do it. So that can be hard to um, uh, to, uh, to sort of into it um and actually well i was going to say some of the others but maybe this the idea of just don't worry is probably um quite an important one that i've i've started recently doing um office hours with people who are sort of just getting into programming and trying to figure things out and something that comes up all the time is whoa there's so much stuff i don't know and everyone else seems to know all of it and uh and i'm just going to be pointless until i know all of it as well and as I say, there's, it's great to learn things. There's loads of stuff out there, but it's, you don't want to get stressed out. I really like how, how your wife went all the way to, uh, till she yeah. got a book about electromagnetism. That, that was, <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah, she's pretty extreme. Um, I should have kept closer tabs, but yeah. And why did she decide to, to become a software developer? I'm, I'm just curious. Um, Well, she works at Stripe as well, because um, we're pretty unimaginative, and she just thought it. I think she just thought it looked really cool, and she was right. 
so <laughs> she, put, she did really well she put a lot of work into learning um, and gone about it very methodically that's, that's nice and from the part of building small tools i, I remember there was this thing uh called the, the unix principle or, or something like that that says something like build a small tools that do one thing and do that one thing really well right yeah all right we we got another question from ed sansom sorry if i'm mispronouncing it uh live my personal life by the by the last oh it's it's a comment hence Run the code, hopefully automate some of the repetitive tasks out of a real the school business. Rob, what originally inspired you to get into programming? Well, the the sort of the kind of very low level answer is that I first studied physics and in physics we did all like mechanics and stuff like that, but we also did a tiny bit of C programming. And I just thought that was way better than physics. It was just so much more fun because it was much easier, or well, not easier, but you could see when you'd got it right, really. Um, and so I just, because you, your program worked and it gave you the answer you expected and brilliant, you crushed it. And then from there, it just became, I just kept doing that and it just was continuously more and more interesting. And it was, it was actually only, uh, let's see, maybe a few years after that, that I kind of realized that programming was sort of a bit cool nowadays, that I thought it was, still just uh, i had this image of just people in a room just tapping at keyboards but no it's 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 really fun um and exciting nowadays so it's not it's not a particularly uh sort of colorful story or anything like that but i think <laughs> the, the rest of um ed's comment is interesting about uh to hopefully automate some repetitive tasks at old school businesses and i think that's great that there must be so many opportunities for uh, for that kind of thing and I think what often happens is people will see I heard this phrase something like every time people email spreadsheets from you know, between themselves a SaaS idea is born that well you shouldn't be emailing spreadsheets I should build a business to do that for you and that's all very well but that you then you have to figure out what's common between all of the different companies doing this you have to make a product and get investors and stuff like that but i think the idea of if you have your own little i mean this i'm sure this is what ed's doing you just have your own little thing you make something it solves your very specific problem probably doesn't solve anyone else's problem at least not yet but who cares that's fine uh, and so i think that's that's a really a really cool way of looking at it and in fact another something that's often occurred to me is that um, if I ever, heaven forbid, if I ever do decide to go and do something else that's not software engineering, I'm kind of hopeful that knowing about like Python will be just some kind of useful superpower in that. I don't really know why or what it would be, but I'm kind of <laughs> optimistic. That's that's a nice story. You, you went the opposite way. You went from the electromagnetism books to the to the Python books. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, I think. I think that's it from the from the questions in the chat. Um, if somebody else wants to throw a question before we wrap things up and finish the lunch and learn. <laughs> I I agree with Paul. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, I think that's it for the for the questions. Robert, again, thank you very much for taking a bit of your time to share your you. your list of traits with us and for giving all these um, all these great examples on how to succeed on a software developer career. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And to all the attendees, thank you. Thank you for coming to another Lunch and Learn with Microverse. And we, we hope to see you soon again. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank